This is the second episode of book review "Becoming" by Michelle Obama, Part Two, "Becoming Us," Chapter Nine. Michelle and Barack's relationship quickly becomes serious when she starts sleeping over at his summertime apartment. The nighttime noise of the street below bothers him less than it does her. One night. As a favor to a friend, he revisits his old role as a community organizer. Seated in back in a church basement, Michelle watches in awe as Barack urges the fifteen or so gathered parishioners to work towards the world as it should be, instead of settling for the world as it is. Michelle introduces Barack to her parents. Her father laughingly tells Craig that the relationship will not last, because Michelle's relationships has always taken a backseat to her ambitions. However, as Barack heads back to Harvard in August, he tells Michelle that he loves her and wants to stay in touch by mail. She, coming from a family of talkers, tells him to become a phone guy. He does. During a Christmas visit to Honolulu, Michelle meets some of Barack's loving and comfortly middle-class family, including his mother and Donham, his half sister, and his African grandparents. She also sees Barack relaxing with longtime friends. And for a change, not worrying about the problems of the world. As a member of her firm's recruiting team, Michelle pushes for consideration of a wider range of applicants than just graduates from Harvard and a few other top schools, and she advocates for use of more holistic selection criteria than just grades. Recruiting visits to Harvard bring welcome time with Barack. Michelle gushes about Barack to Suzanne, with whom she stayed in touch after Princeton. Suzanne, carefree as ever, is quitting her job to see the world with her mother, a choice Michelle disapproves of. After the trip, Suzanne calls to say that she was just diagnosed with advanced cancer. A couple of mutual friends look in on Suzanne and keep Michelle posted. Michelle is at Suzanne's bedside when she dies. Chapter Ten. During his final summer associateship with a different Chicago firm, Barack moves in with Michelle in the apartment upstairs from her parents. On the basketball court. Barack passes Craig's character test by showing the right balance of a willingness to pass and a willingness to shoot. As the newly elected first black president of the Harvard Law Review, he could easily go into corporate law after graduation, but he is instead thinking about of a less lucrative career in civil rights law. Michelle hates being a lawyer. And she is in love with a man whose intellect and ambition threaten to overwhelm hers. In a journal she has started keeping, she anxiously explores other career possibilities. Her mother chuckles at Michelle's predicament and is not sympathetic. The topic of marriage is a source of disagreement between Michelle and Barack. She believes that two people who love each other will want to merge their lives into one, the way her parents did. Barack is in much less of a hurry to get married. For him, marriage is a way for two people to bring their lives into parallel while each pursuing their own dreams. His motto is his independent-minded, twice-divorced mother. Fraser Robinson's deterioration accelerates, his feet and neck swell, affecting his walking and his speech and breathing. He insists on continuing to work and refuses to see a doctor. 
Finally, he's taken to hospital by ambulance. Tests bring a diagnosis, but no hope. He has an advanced endocrine disorder. Ten days later, and hours before he dies, his last moments with Michelle are full of unspoken tender thoughts. Chapter Eleven: Michelle's sense loss lead to a fight with Craig over the choice of a casket for their father. Soon, however, Michelle reflects that Suzanne's and her father's deaths carry a lesson: life is short. She starts exploring her career options in earnest. Michelle's mother once briefly worked for Art Sussman, a lawyer for the University of Chicago. He introduces Michelle to Susan Sher, a city hall lawyer, who in turn introduces her to Valerie Jarrett. Jarrett served on the staff of Chicago's first black mayor, Harold Washington. And now works for Mayor Richard M. Daley, sons of Richard J. Daley, who had been Chicago's mayor during the tu- tubular 1960s. Valerie impresses both Michelle and later Barack with her knowledge of Chicago politics and her conviction that there is room within the system to do good things and to advocate for the interests of the black community. Even under a mayor whose family name is synonymous with old-school white Chicago politics, Barack is in a good mood after taking the bar exam. Although Michelle passed only on her second attempt, she and Barack are confident he passed on his first. At a celebratory dinner, Barack professes his love for Michelle, but repeats his arguments against marriage. Michelle tries to control her anger, but when a waiter lifts a lid on the dessert tray to reveal a ring, she realizes that Barack has pranked her. When he proposes on one knee, she accepts. Soon they visit Kenya, so he can introduce her to his granny Sarah. Michelle feels strangely out of place as an African American in Africa. But Granny Sarah makes her feel welcomed and loved. Chapter Twelve. During the next year, Michelle works for Valerie Jarrett as a citywide representative of the mayor's office. Michelle is inspired by the skill and confidence with which Valerie and Su- Susan Sher juggle responsibilities as single mothers. Barack, meanwhile. Does voter registration work in the Chicago area for a national organization called Project Vote? At Michelle and Barack's wedding in October of 1992, Michelle's high school friend Santita Jackson, now a professional singer, performs "You and I" from the Stevie Wonder album Southside gave Michelle decades ago. After the honeymoon in California, there is both good and bad news. The good news: Barack's voter registration work has helped Bill Clinton to win the presidency, and Carl Masanli Brown to win her U.S. Senate race, making her the first Black woman elected to the Senate. The African American vote in Chicago has mattered. The bad news: Barack has been neglecting a book project he has under contract for, and the publisher has now canceled the contract and wants the advance back. Barack announces that he is heading off to a cabin for a couple of months to finish the book, so he can sell it to some other publisher. The cabin is nine thousand miles away in Bali. Michelle is left to wonder whether she will be able to have both a career, like Mary on the Mary Tyler Moore Show, and a settled home life like her mother, a black version of June Cleaver on Leave It to Beaver. The question is still unanswered when Barack returns home with a nearly finished first draft and a contract with a new publisher. Michelle says goodbye to City Hall and plans to look for work in the nonprofit sector. 
the Obamas buy a condo in Hyde Park. Chapter Thirteen. Michelle becomes the founding director of a new organization, Public Allies, that places talented young people in a apprenticeship position in the nonprofit sector. After three years, thanks in part to support Michelle and Barack's lineup through their various Chicago connections, the organization is on sound financial footing. A tip from Art Sussman leads. Michelle to a job at the University of Chicago with better pay and better health insurance. She becomes an associate dean with a focus on community relations. One of her tasks is to find ways to connect students to volunteer opportunities in the surrounding neighborhood. Barack works for a public interest law firm, mostly on voting rights and employment discrimination cases. He also teaches a class at the University of Chicago Law School, and occasionally runs community organizing workshops. Working at night in a bookstore place, he and Michelle call the hole. Barack has finished his book, Dreams of My Father, a scandal involving a sitting member of the Chicago State House, creates an opening for Barack to to run for the Illinois State Senate. Although Michelle doesn't care for politics and predicts that the experience will grind Barack down, she isn't prepared to veto the idea. When Barack wins his race and takes his seat as an Illinois legislator, it turns out that despite all the expected challenges, the work suits him. Both Barack and Michelle, however, suffer more loss and grief. Barack's mother is diagnosed with cancer and dies before Barack is able to fly to Honolulu to say goodbye. Michelle suffers a miscarriage. After failed attempts to conceive again, the Obamas turn into IVF. Their first daughter, Malia, is born on the fourth of July. Chapter fourteen. Michelle negotiates a half-time return to her job as an associate dean, but even with the help of a highly capable babysitter, she feels badly overextended. Barack, after being re-elected to the state senate, decides to challenge an incumbent Democratic U.S. congressman for his seat in the primary election. A Christmas time visit with Barack's grandmother Tote in Hawaii is interrupted by news from Springfield, Illinois' capital, of an abruptly scheduled vote on a major crime bill. When Malia is too sick with an ear infection to fly back home, and Barack chooses to stay with his family, his opponent blasts him for being away at a critical time. Barack's donor and endorsement support dwindles, and he lo- loses badly in the spring primary. After a single round of IVF, the Obamas welcome Sasha into the family, but soon the departure of the beloved babysitter forces Michelle to reassess her work situation. Fortunately, the new president of the University of Chicago Medical Center is willing to hire her as the director of community outreach, knowing that she will need flexibility to deal with her responsibilities as a mother. With a full-time salary, she will be able to pay for more help at home. By now, George W. Bush is the president, and America has been through the 9/11 attacks. Barack is thinking of running for the U.S. Senate, but Michelle is losing her patience with him. He's away too much, and habitually comes home late at night than promised. A couple therapist helps the Obamas make some adjustments. For Michelle, the adjustments will include a morning workout routine with a friend. And at night, a fixed dinner time and bedtime, whether Barack is home or not. Chapter fifteen. 
As a mother of two young girls, Michelle learns to carve out moments to grab a snack, to do or do some quick shopping. At the hospital, she builds a program that increases the use of volunteers, gets staff more involved in the community, and improves care for the underinsured and the chronically ill. She now knows that Barack's ambitions will always take him away from home for days on end. When he starts planning his 2004 U.S. Senate campaign, she only asks that if he loses, he will move on from politics to something else. Instead, through a series of events, Barack is headed for victory even before his keynote addresses at the Democratic convention makes him a national star. He wins the Senate race by a landslide in an election that also sends Republican President George W. Bush back to the White House. Instead of moving to Washington, when Barack takes his seat in the Senate, Michelle stays in Chicago with the girls. Despite another Senate's wife's advice that leaving apart is bad for families, Michelle finds Washington self-important. And the briefing given to new Senate spouses a waste of time. She wants to continue working at the hospital, where she has recently been promoted. It also bothers her that Barack is already talking with advisors about a 2008 presidential run. Even six-year-old Malia finds that premature. However, when Michelle thinks of all of The people who are less fortunate, like those recently made homeless by Hurricane Katrina, and when she thinks of Barack's character and the opportunity for him to make life better for such people, she agrees to let him campaign and to pay play the role she knows will be expected of her. She also has another unspoken thought: as a black man, he cannot win. Chapter Sixteen. Barack hires David Ploch as overall campaign manager and puts David Alexon in charge of messaging and media. The campaign launch in Springfield takes place outdoors on a freezing day that makes Michelle pleased. She got warm cups on the girls. The first crucial contest is the Iowa caucus. Media coverage is sometimes very negative and very personal. A magazine profile of Barack links a past ser- sermon by Rev. Jeremy Wright, the Obama's former pastor in Chicago, to Barack's radical roots, and there is a speculation that Michelle owes her cap- hospital job to Barack's political connections. Rumors circulate on the internet about Barack having Muslim lo- lo- loyalties and having had a terrorist for a friend in the 1970s. Supported by aide Melissa Winter and communications director Katie Levert, Michelle speaks at homes and visits county fairs, finding that she has more in common with Iowans. Than some people might expect, having been given no particular script to follow, she shows a gift for talking from her heart with undecided voters and earns the campaign nickname "the closer." She gets used to having Secret Service agents around, and she learns to choose finger foods that will not stain clothing if spilled. When it comes. Clear that the family isn't eating right. She hires Sam Cass, a young chef, to prepare more nutritious meals. He soon becomes part of the family's inner circle. At the Iowa Democratic Party's traditional Jefferson Jackson dinner, eight weeks before the caucus, all candidates seek to showcase their support and their speaking skills. Barack is polling well behind the front runner Hillary Clinton, and contending with 2004 vice presidential nominee John Edwards for second place.
the last to speak. Barack gave a strong speech, and soon after, pulls into a tie with Clinton. Two months later, when he wins the caucus, Michelle thinks that maybe he can win the presidency after all. Chapter Seventeen. As a girl, Michelle was once caught by surprise when a bully punched her in the face. She has the same feeling now. When a video of one of her speeches is edited down to fourteen words, for the first time in my adult lifetime, I'm really proud of my country. The quote is from remarks Michelle has given many times, but out of context. It suggests that she carries a grudge against America. Other stories fuel the narrative. Rev Wright, it comes out, expressed. Resentment towards whites in his sermons more than once, and Michelle's Princeton senior thesis is offered as evidence that she has similar feelings by people that she calls the haters. Michelle finds herself feeling a bit angry about it. This leads her to comment that the circular logic of the stereotype of the angry black woman can act as a trap for women who have perfectly valid reasons to raise their voices, albeit emotional or angry. David Axler and Valerie Jarrett, now a campaign advisor, advise Michelle that fairly or not. As a woman, she must try harder than a man now to come across as angry. Michelle is given added staff and resources. Soon, she makes a well-received appearance on the View. Finally, after the Clinton campaign concedes, the path is clear for Barack to be the Democratic nominee. At the August convention, introduced by Craig, and with her mother in the audience. Michelle gives a speech in which she talks about her father and about Barack. Afterward, Michelle knows she may have changed some people's perceptions of her. Michelle is growing used to life in the public eye, but she remembers a Fourth of July in Boto, Montana, that showed the importance of perspective. Toward the end of a long day. All four Obamas sat down for an interview. The Michelle and Barack later decided to put too much of a spotlight on the girls. An evening birthday party for Malia felt improvised and unsatisfactory. Malia, however, had a grand time. Best birthday ever. Chapter eighteen. The general campaign is less stressful than the primaries, especially after Republican John McCain chooses the underprepared Alaska governor Sarah Palin as his running mate, and she becomes something of a joke. The stakes of the campaign go up, however, when the growing financial crisis sends the economy into a downward spiral. More than ever. Michelle feels that Barack is the right person for the moment. Barack's grandmother Toot dies of cancer just ten days after one last visit from Barack, and just two days before the election. On election day morning, Michelle and Barack take the girls along to the polls before sending them off to school. After Barack teases Michelle for hesitating as she makes her ballot, he and Craig head off for a stress-relieving game of basketball. The polls show Barack ahead, but Michelle worries about the so-called Bradley effect, named after Tom Bradley, a black Los Angeles mayor who lost the California government's race after leading consistently. Some voters, the theory goes, hide their prejudices from Pulitzer but express them at the ballot box. At the returns coming, however, it soon becomes clear that Barack and his running mate Joe Biden have, have won. After Barack's victory speech in Chicago's Harborside Grand Park, the mood of the late-night crowd seems to Michelle calm and reflective. 
This moment has been a long time coming. That's a wrap for part two, becoming us. Stay tuned for the last part, part three, becoming more. Thanks for watching. It's Jia here. We'll see you next Friday.